Well, good afternoon. I hope you had a good lunch. And today I will talk about translating software using related languages. And a few words about me. I am uh, leading the uh, Latvian GNOME translation team. Essentially, I am Latvian GNOME translation team, but we have a community that also translates other software like Ubuntu and LibreOffice. And uh, I'm part of that uh, whole effort. I've been translating software for uh, roughly 10 years and I have started on Ubuntu 606 and this is uh, ever since I have been working on the translations and I am doing that as a hobby. Turns out there's not much money into it. Okay, so roughly this talk is about uh, software localization, what it is, and uh, how to translate uh, large pro projects like uh, GNOME. and. Uh, well, uh, how can we improve it if we already have a translation available which uh, which is done in a similar language? So if you're a translator or you want to create a new translation team, this talk is for you. Okay, and I am, well, my talk is mostly in the, informed by, um, by my experience with trying to translate Ubuntu into Latgalian. I failed, of course. But uh, I will go into details exactly what happened. And uh, even though I do not speak uh, Latgalian, that's one of the reasons why I failed. But uh, uh, still, I, I have made some experiments uh, and uh, it seems promising. I will show you what, why exactly. So, why should you care about localization? It's um, essentially it's translating uh, software into the, another language. And it is a form of, a form of accessibility. If you don't believe this, try to ins uh, use your GNOME desktop in Portuguese. I'm sure it's a lovely language, but this is, but it will be much more difficult to do that if you do not understand half the words that are used there. Uh, also, um, localized software is easier to learn. If uh, if you are not an English native speaker, then then uh, it is more difficult to understand what features the, uh, the software provides, and users are more confident in situations which uh, they are not familiar. They are not familiar with. Sometimes you can just learn to use the software just by memory or looking how other people are using it. If, uh, however, if there's some error thrown up, uh, uh, then uh, uh, they they will be lost. So this is also useful for those situations. And people are just more comfortable with the familiar things. And uh, this is also uh, not noticeable when people are using uh, computers in English and they give them localized versions, they are confused because they don't know what's happening. So this works both ways. But for newcomers, this can be really useful. Also, uh, it strengthens the language because if there are some domains in which the language is uh, not used, then it's... Uh, or dangerous for the language itself. So, if you are, if you want to preserve your native language, uh, this is also important. Okay. So, currently, what's happening uh, as of now uh, for in the translation world? There are some challenges when you're translating software. It's not just like translating book or something because strings are not sentences uh, which come in order and are uh, well in context. For example, we can have uh, composite strings, uh, for example, welcome, and there's some variable there. What is what is behind that variable? You might not know. Sometimes the strings are just fragments of the larger piece. For example, space by space. Is that uh, does it mean the song is uh, performed by an artist? Sometimes these things happen too, and you have to know a. You have to understand the application you're using, where it's in the uh, user interface, uh, to be able to uh, do this properly. There are also uh, problems with context. For example, if you have a simple string called exporting, what does this mean? Does it, is it a menu item that will lead you to a dialog that will give you an option to export? Or is it a status that something is exporting as of now? And uh, so, uh, Another problem is that the terminology has to be consistent. In, uh, for example, when you're translating uh, literary texts, uh, using different words to describe the same thing is a good thing. In technical writing, it's the opposite. 
and the styling must be consistent and when you have uh, multiple people working on the same um, translation this might be an issue so what do we have to mitigate these problems we have spot checkers we have glossaries or where we can keep the terminology we have guidelines which can help to define what is the styling that we need and translation memory memory which can, which we use to well, <coughs> Uh, to, uh, to uh, make the translation pro process quicker. However, most of these tools are limited or non-available for, for smaller languages. Um, for example, if you don't have glossary or guidelines uh, and you've just started, you certainly don't have translation memory. So this is, these are challenges that are really hard for newcomers, for, for new language teams. So, so shameless plug. Uh, what tools I would recommend? Use Localize if you want to translate huge projects. Translate Toolkit are great command line tools uh, which you should look into. They can help you. Microsoft Localization Style Guides. If you don't have your own style guide, look at what Microsoft uh, suggests. They will probably be wrong, but at least they give you a uh, material to uh, think over what is important. And of course, GNOME Internationalization Wiki. Um, so how to do that for GNOME in particular. However, if we want to uh, translate the huge GNOME project faster, we need to do some auto we might need to do some automation. So what are our options here? For the computer translation, these are the general um, directions we can take. The, well, one is the rule-based approach, and the other is statistical. For rule base, there roughly the idea is that either you have uh, very simple, just to replace words, you have a dictionary, you see one word, you replace it with another, or maybe you can go for a bit more advanced, like transfer method, where you also like make a linguistic uh, analysis of the sentence, reorder words, uh, do things like that. And the, the other branch is, is a statistical approach, where you have uh, large parallel texts where you analyze how to translate bet um, between those and or <coughs> or you can use huge non parallel texts and use dictionaries to, uh, this is the parallel text and huge non parallel are the no, not no, but the google translate approach these work good if you have huge languages like spanish english pairs work great the problem is if uh, you have a small language, then pro probably you don't have a uh, huge uh, uh, text. So uh, I was uh, wondering whether we could use the most simple rule-based dictionary approach and whether it would work. So I did some research and I found out that uh, in the 90s uh, there was a system called uh, Cesilco. Yeah, that was developed in, uh, in academia in uh, for Czech, Slovak, and Czech Russian translations, and uh, they tried out the method that they just would simply, brutally replace word by word, no, uh, no fancy stuff, uh, just replacement, and they found out that they have uh, about ninety percent of success rate between uh, these languages. Maybe the Czech and Slovak are, are more related, but even uh, Czech and Russian, which are rather different, but they still have the similar grammatical forms, that even here you could have 90% success rate, and it is really good result, since you just only have to um, tidy up the translation, and you don't have to do the bulk of the translations yourself. So, this is the reason why I thought that, well, maybe I could use this for our, my own case. However, this is for the literary texts, and for uh, user interface translations, there are some uh, special cases. Uh, so I made my own uh, script called uh, Machine Translation, Translation Word by Word or Empty Words uh, for short, and uh, it's based on the Translate Toolkit uh, uh, framework. I, if you have used it, you will like Paul Merge or Paul Dictionary. Uh, for uh, terminology, you will be familiar with the syntax, and it works like this: you uh, you give an input about, uh, for in this case, I have GNOME 
Latvian translation. You say where to put the output and uh, point out that uh, the dictionary is over there, and that's it. Uh, or also you can translate uh, whole directories. For example, you say there's a whole GNOME uh, with GIMP and uh, GNOME extras and documentation. Just go, go do your thing and it will translate it. So, for example, how it would work. Uh, it would, for example, the happy case you have an English uh, string closed window. Latvian translation is, in this case, Iceberg Log. And uh, the script figures out that in Latvian, yes, there are two words and it just looks up in the dictionary. Simple enough, nothing interesting. Uh, one case I've figured out that would be problematic for uh, in dictionary is that there are words which you should not translate. For example, in this case, uh, Firefox is a brand name, we don't translate it. We look up, the, okay, there's an English and Latvian for Firefox. We mark it as duplicates, we don't uh, attempt to translate it. it. My script also understands that there are URLs and tags which should be never be touched. They're literals. They flag as, as the literals and uh, doesn't uh, um, translate them. In this case, you can see that the URL contains uh, the word um, uz, which is both translatable in the start of the string and not translatable in a URL itself, so it's not marked as duplicate in this case. So it still correctly figures out that it should be translated in the, outside the URL, but should be left alone uh, in, inside the URL. Um, another thing that was rather uh, interesting is that the getx uh, the translations have uh, variables, which also should not be uh, changed in, in any way. So here too, the heat, uh, it uses the getx flags to figure out what variables are used and what formatting, uh, how to recognize it, uh, and yeah, it also doesn't uh, Touch those. Um, and one really painful thing that was uh, is the accelerators. So in our case, we sometimes use uh, underscore to indicate that when you press the, the keyboard, like uh, control and the letter, in this case, letter A, it will just execute uh, the menu item or a button or whichever the element it is. In uh, this case, the translation tool also has to figure out that uh, the accelerator has to be removed, especially if it's inside the word. Uh, so before it goes to translate, it finds the accelerator, removes it, and does its translation work, and then puts back the accelerator. Um, sometimes the accelerators are not really accelerators. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to always catch all out these cases, um, but uh, yeah, this is this might be a source of problems, but there are not that many of those. Okay, so this is roughly how the uh, it goes. So about the dictionary itself, right now it's super simple. It's a comma separated values format. Uh, it means you open it in spreadsheet and just edit away. Uh, for example, here we have a dictionary of four words. You indicate from and to, well, that's obvious, and the third column is whether there might be problems. Uh, if, you, if you feel that, if you would replace the first word with the second, if you think that this will end in tears, like as the, you feel that the editor should really, really look into this, you should uh, mark it as a problematic, and uh, then it will not. It, it will make the translation, but it will indicate to the uh, translator that this, uh, not to the reviewer, that the, uh, they should go into this. Okay. So how to uh, create the uh, dictionary itself? Take the script, show it where to find the file you want to translate, and indicate uh, and show where to output the uh, dictionary. It will go through the uh, for, for a file, look at all the words it thinks that sh it should translate and extract them into these uh, comma separate values format and uh, give it to the translator and move over it. Updating is 
uh, rather similar if you already have a dictionary. Okay, so how did it go for the Latin and Flood Galleon? I, the prototype I first made was to translate uh, to translate events, and it's, uh, the events was about at the time 360 strings, and the results were that none of the strings were substantially wrong. That means that uh, the user should be should be able to pretty clearly understand what it says, even if it's what wasn't clear. Uh, um, there were no needs to re reorder words, which is really annoying when uh, someone, when the editor uh, just needs to make some minor changes, like uh, replace a one or two letters. It's easy if you have to start to re reorder words. Sometimes it's easy. sometimes it's easier easier just to um, rewrite the string. So in this case, there was no need for that. There was one case where the duplication was. Um, miscategorized, so the words were marked as duplicate, but they shouldn't have. And uh, minor edits for the uh, award were for 19 words. And seven strings were wrong in the original. So about 95% success rate, which I think is pretty good if you only need to do an occasional edit here or there and not to translate the whole uh, application. So, how much would it take to translate whole of the GNOME? Well, it depends strongly on which source language you have. For example, if you have Latvian, then it's about 1600 uh, word dictionary, which is pretty big. However, if you, if you have Spanish uh, language as your source, then it would be about 8000 uh, words. So it really depends. Yeah, German is uh, also a big one. Chinese is 32,000. I'm not sure why it's so big and why Hindi language only had about two or three thousand if, if it was 100% translated. So it might really vary. If you want to find out for your particular language, run the script, look at the dictionary and see how much uh, words it proposes to, uh, uh, how much words it has gathered for translation. The question that might arise is, what is a word exactly? Frankly, I'm not really sure. It is determined by this regular expression over here, and whatever that thing says is a word, that thing is a word. I'm not sure if it works correctly for Chinese or Hindi or any other language that is not of the European classical alphabet. But for European languages, it's mostly okay, but not always. For example, in English, the, the words don't and can't, for example, will not be recognized as, as a single proper word, and wor there is no such word as don or can. Now, can is, but T isn't. So this is a bit, uh, this might be a problem, perhaps. It's not for Latvian, so that's good for me. But you should check it out, uh, in your case in particular. Okay, so what were issues that were discovered? Uh, using this method. Errors in strings accumulate. The translators of your related language which you from, from on which you base your own translations, they might contain errors and you will of course inherit those errors. Another problem that might you might have is that the grammar of the related language gets copied. That means uh, that uh, if you do have some subtle gr grammatical differences, the editor might be too lazy to change them. For example, uh, us, the Latvian team, which just translates from English to Latvian, tend to borrow the English grammar, which is wrong. You might have the same problems. Okay, there is also that you have to sh follow the schedule of the other team, and if they are missing the, um, um, the milestones, then you will miss them too. And also, this does not solve the problems of creating terminology and th uh, this is the hardest problem of them all finding the right words for the things you're trying to describe and in Latvian we've been doing that for 25 years and we're still halfway there and it's a hard process however there are positive things too this you can get the insight of the other teams uh, of the other team for free they will probably spend countless uh, nights figure, trying to figure out how to properly translate the uh, strings. And uh, 
you get that insight for free. You just replace words. Okay, also the dictionary is the spell checker. If you don't have the spell checker, but the dictionary is, is properly made and is double checked, then you, you don't have to worry about uh, misspelling words. You, you also, you can, uh, in the dictionary, you can see that sometimes the original team has also ha have made misspellings of the words, and if you have good communication, you can help the, that team to uh, fix their own bugs. And also that the checking the, uh, can be done by less qualified language speakers. That is, they don't need to know the technical terminology, they don't need to know the uh, the grammar very well, they just uh, need to adjust the strings here or there, at least for Latgali and it works because they usually are just minor edits and uh, they don't need to understand the terminology or understand the application itself, just how to tweak the and word endings here or there. Okay, and it seems I'm out of time, so I will not talk about the future of it, but if you're interested, the repository is over here at GitLab. I am reachable by this email, and I will be at the localization and documentation Burns of the Feather at the room 6 uh, in the afternoon. So, if you want to chat about this, uh, find me there. Thank you. Yes, uh, we can take uh, one or two questions if there's any. Uh, it does not seem like so. Uh, thank you very much.